Okay, everyone, let's start today um, with the second video for chapter nine. And um, we're going to talk about um, two important types of samples. Um, so, or with two samples. So, the first definition we're going to talk about <clears throat> is two samples are independent if the sample values selected from one population are not related to or somehow paired or matched with the sample values from the selected other population. And two samples are dependent or consist of match pairs if members of one sample can be used to determine members of the other sample. So um, for me, the main way I can recognize it very quickly for dependent um, versus independent. So if you won't know one is dependent, um, then you know it's obviously not independent. Is a lot of times in medical studies, you know, like if they're trying to test blood pressure medication or cholesterol medication, you know, they might take your blood pressure at a certain point and then they'll administer your medication for a few weeks and then they'll start taking your um, blood pressure after you've taken the medication. So in that case, let's say they took 100 people and they took their blood pressure on the first of the month and then they gave them blood pressure medication for 30 days and then they took their blood pressure again, those same 30 people. So that would definitely be match pairs because it's the same sample just being tested two different times and data, data being gathered. So that's how normally I determine if something is dependent um, and normally it's pretty obvious like that. It, it can be a little bit of a gray area sometimes, but in general, um, I feel like that's the best way to identify um, dependent. And for our class, I'll try to stick to samples that are very obviously dependent versus independent, okay? Um, so whenever you have like, um, you know, somebody trying to um, test a group and then retest that group, that's almost always gonna be match pairs, okay? Um, and that's the dependent one. Uh, okay, so let's look at about inferences about two means. In this section, we use two independent samples to test claims about differences between mu1 and mu2 in the population, um, or we might even construct confidence intervals to estimate mu1 and mu2. So here's the requirements, pretty standard stuff. Um, two samples are independent, both samples are random samples, and either or both of the following are satisfied. The group is larger than 30, or both samples come from normally distributed populations. And sigma one and sigma two are unknown, and we do not assume that they are equal. Okay, so in general, in general, you will not know the standard deviation of the population of either population in general, and you don't assume they are equal. If you do assume they are equal, something different um, we can get into. Okay, so um, this is the very long formula. Okay, so we're going to use our calculator instead of having to do this formula by hand like we did in the previous section. We're going to use the calculator for this, okay? <clears throat> and again, just to reiterate, means of independent samples when standard deviation is unknown. Um, so you can't say they're equal if you don't know them, right? So um, that's kind of what they mean here. So this is what I really want you guys to focus on right here. This is how we're going to do these type of problems. So when you're working with your cheat sheet or you're trying to get some notes ready to take the exam um, towards the end of the semester, uh, I would definitely have, this is one of your um, formulas, or I should say your calculator process where, and you can identify this to use with two samples, okay? When you are comparing or um, working with means, all right? <clears throat> so this is a two sample t-test. So just like before, we're gonna do everything the same. It says, in an experiment designed to test effectiveness of paroxetine for treating bipolar depression, subjects were measured using a Hamilton depression scale with the following, the following results. They had a placebo group and they had a paroxetine group. So these are different groups. These aren't the same people and then they give them this. Um, these are two different samples, okay? One has 43 people in it, one has 33 people in it, okay? Um, so you have, um, you know, they give you all the data, X bar one, M, X bar two, S standard deviation one, standard deviation two, so on and so on. So we're gonna do everything the same. We're gonna do our step one. Our step one, okay, and our step one says, you know, maybe I'll do everything in red right now. Um, our step one says, um, or oh, and it says use a significant significance level to test the claim that the placebo group has a larger mean depression level than the drug group in the population. Okay, so oops, sorry about that. So we're going to have our claim. We're going to have our opposite claim. <clears throat> 
So the claim is the placebo group, and that's group one. So mu one has a larger mean depression. So that's going to be greater than mu two. Oops. So then that means the opposite claim would be mu one less than or equal to mu two. Okay, so now we can state our null. And now we can state our alternate. Okay, and remember, sometimes the homework doesn't ask for step one or step three. They just jump straight to step two to step four. Okay, so you guys can hop around too, but just I'm kind of showing you this so you know that it's the same way every time. But if the homework or on the exams or the quizzes, they ask you for different um, ordering of it, that's fine because you have all of it. You just got to figure out which way they want it. Okay, so the null is always the equal sign. So we're going to say mu1 equals mu2. Okay, and then the opposite would be mu1 greater than mu2. Okay. And then we also know, I guess I'm running out of room a little bit, three, we know that alpha is worth, hold on one second. Sorry about that. So we know that alpha is worth um, where do they say? A uh, significance level of 0 0.05. Okay, and we know that this is a right tail test or a um, right direction test, I've heard called. Okay, so then it says compute this test statistic. So we have all this information now. Okay, so we're going to compute the test statistic, but we're not going to do it with this formula. If you didn't have a cal graphing calculator, you would have to do it this way. You would have to use this formula um, to do the t-value, to find your t-value, where you do the two means and you subtract them. This, remember, will always be zero, okay? Because if mean one, so look right here, if mu one equals mu two, what if you were to subtract mu two over to the other side? You would have mu one minus mu two. Well, what does that have to equal? That has to equal zero because you subtracted it over to the other side. There's nothing left over there. So that's why in this formula, a lot of times this part kind of gets forgotten because the null is saying that mu one minus mu two are the same, okay? So if you subtract them, then you get zero. And then the denominator is the variance divided by the, fir the first um, variance divided by the sample size, and then the second variance divided by the sample size, but basically variance is just the standard deviation squared, and then you square root that. So we're not gonna do all that, but you could. It, it's very doable. What we're going to choose to do is we're going to use our calculator and we're going to go into what the directions say, stat test two sample t test. Okay, so we're going to go into stat test and then on mine it's number four. So and then you use statistics, don't use data. And then I want you guys to enter all this in and then you're going to get down to the very bottom and it's going to say pooled versus unpooled. Um, or pooled yes or pooled no. So we're not going to pull this data. We're not going to pull it because we do not know if the standard deviations are the same or if they're even close. Um, again, there's two, I, I've done a little research on it and it seems like there's kind of um, a lot of conflicting opinions on when to use pooled data versus unpooled data. Um, and what I've kind of seen is that the safer route is to use unpooled. Um, it's a little bit safer. Um, pooled, out, pooled data is a little more accurate if it was supposed to be pooled. You do lose a little bit of accuracy um, if you use unpooled when it was supposed to be pooled, um, but you lose a lot more accuracy if you pool it when it was supposed to be unpooled. So I'm going to go with unpooled and pretty much unless we say otherwise, kind of go with unpooled. Um, but there are situations if you know the standard deviations are the same or the sample sizes are identical or stuff like that, you can use um, Okay, so I get my t value from my calculator after I hit enter. I get t is equal to 1.3 to um, 1, I guess. It's 1.3209, so I'm going to do 1.321. And it even tells me my p value. It even tells me that if I were to draw this, right, and I made my little shading. Here somewhere 1.321 this would have an area of 0 0.0955 so 
that is my p-value. So that area right there would be 0 0.095. And again, I'm getting this right from the calculator, okay? And remember, this calculator p-value is not the population proportion p. Um, that is kind of a problem with some stats um, classes, is they use the letter p like four or five different times in formulas. So you have p for population proportion, you have p hat for population proportion estimate or point estimate, you have um, p for probability, you have the p-value, and then later on we're going to learn something else for p as well. So there's quite a few times that we use the letter P in um, statistics. So just make sure you understand this is the p-value on the calculator, not the population proportion. Okay. Oops. So um, now based on this information, we can say our p-value. And that's 0 0.0955. That's a pretty big um, p-value in terms of uh, normal p-values and we're using significance level of 0 0.05 so our p-value of 0 0.0955 is greater than alpha equals 0 0.05 um, so we fail to reject So then we say there is insufficient evidence or not enough evidence to support the claim. And again, in the homework, they're going to be picky. So I'm going to start. I'm going to try um, start to try, or I'm going to try to start doing this for you guys. Where. It says using them as a test to claim that the placebo group has a larger mean depression level than the drug group. So we actually can't support that. So we say there's insufficient evidence to support the claim that the placebo group has a higher mean depression. Than who? Than the drug group. So um, basically, if you were a researcher and you were trying to get funding for this drug, this would not really help you much because you can't definitively say that the drug seems to be helping with mean with the depression on average. If you're if you're trusting this Hamilton test for depression, so it says there's insufficient evidence to support the claim. Um, that the placebo group has a higher mean depression than the drug group. So we cannot support this claim right here. Um, we cannot support the claim that they asked us to right here. And that was our alternate hypothesis. We could not support that. We wanted to, but the data just didn't support it. Um, so that's what we kind of went into this trying to support. And we don't have enough evidence to say that, yeah, it's working. Um, maybe it is, maybe it's not, but we can't definitively say, um, or not with any level of confidence, okay? So let's move on to the next problem now that you guys kind of see how this works. So it says the following data was obtained from normally distributed population um, about filtered versus non-filtered cigarettes. So we have filtered kings versus non-filtered kings. Um, all measurements are in milligrams. Use a significance level to test the claim filtered king size cigarettes have a lower mean amount of nicotine than non-filtered king size cigarettes. So we have to do R1. So R1 is the claim. And the opposite, remember this step is just about writing it in mean, median, or, or mean, or standard deviation, uh, sigma, or in population proportion. Um, but for these, we're working with means. Okay, so in this problem, it's saying that to have filtered king cigarettes have a lower mean amount of nicotine than non-filtered. Okay, so group one, or mean one, has a lower amount than group two on average of nicotine. So then the opposite claim would be mu1 greater than or equal to mu2. So now we can do our null, right? Our null says that mu1 equals mu2. So they're the same. And, and again, remember, that's what you're doing. You're, you're not like in the previous chapter, it was just one sample and you were just trying to say if it's bigger than the population or less than the population or, you know, whatever, what was stated um, in this 
situation in chapter nine, we're comparing two means and we're trying to say this mean is bigger than this mean or this mean is big, smaller than this mean. Uh, or these two means are just different. We don't know bigger or smaller, we just care about being different. Um, so that's the comparison. We're comparing the two different samples, okay, instead of the overall population. Um, but we're trying to say that claim about the overall population. I think I kind of worded that bad. So um, maybe I'll have to think of a better way to phrase that. Um, so mean one lot less than mean two. And then step three, we know our alpha is worth 0 0.05 and we know this is left. Right? Because it is a, once again, the alternate hypothesis tell, oops. Left tail. And uh, once again, the alternate hypothesis is what told us that it was left tail. Okay. And again, you know, if you're doing the homework, they may not ask you for all of this, but you can find it all if needed. Okay. So now we're going to have to take out our calculator. Um, so maybe pause the video, try to see if you can enter this in the calculator. Um, I'm going to be entering it in why we go. Uh, so let's see here. I'm going to go stat test two sample t tests. I'm going to use statistics. My x1 is 0 0.94, 0 0.31, 21. My x2 is 1.65, 0 0.16, and 8. And we're doing less than this time. And we're doing unpooled or no pooled. <clears throat> So um, I get T is equal, T equals, um, oh, well, no, I forgot to write it in the last one, but what I should be writing is two sample T test right here. So two sample T test, okay, and that says that T is equal to negative 8.051, okay? And then that gives me my p-value of 1.3696 times 10 to the negative eight, okay? And <clears throat> let's see here. Um, that means that our p-value is very, very, very small. So we say our p-value is less than, p-value is less than um, our alpha level equal to 0 0.05, which this is one. negative eight. So um, remember, don't forget the times 10 to the negative eight. A lot of students forget that. That means that this number is so close to zero, it's really hard to tell the difference. That is definitely going to be less than 0 0.05. So our p-value is less than our alpha. We reject the null. Okay. So in our conclusion, we can say we have sufficient evidence so we can support the claim we do have enough evidence to support the claim that now let's go back and look at the claim the filtered king size cigarettes have a lower mean amount of nicotine that filtered cigarettes have Okay, so what they're basically trying to say, it sounds like this study was being done to show that the filter is actually lowering the nicotine levels um, in cigarettes that you consume. Um, so just, you know, 
this is how people use this stuff. Now, we're not going to go into saying that. We're just going to say that we have sufficient evidence to support the claim that the filtered King cigarettes have a lower mean than non-filtered King cigarettes. And then you could go on further, you know, if you really wanted to, to say, it seems like filtered cigarettes are, you know, healthier. That's something else somebody else would say, right? So we're just kind of sticking to the facts. You may be asked later in a different problem, does it seem like the treatment is working or something? So you'd say, yeah, it does seem like the filters are working or the drug in a different problem is working, okay? Um, once again, we're gonna now switch to confidence intervals real quick. Okay, so the confidence interval for two independent means where sigma one and sigma two are unknown. Again, we don't know them, so we can't say they're equal or they're even close. Um, the confidence interval to estimate mu one minus mu two is given by this formula. Again, we're going to use the calculator to do this, um, but that's how you would do it by hand. Um, and here's the really important part right here okay it's all about zero for this if there is a difference between the two means zero will not be in the confidence interval so remember that when you do mu1 minus mu2 if they were the same they equal zero so that would mean that the null hypothesis um you know you can't disprove the null the null is assuming they're the same and you're trying to show that they're different <clears throat> So the confidence interval does something similar. Remember the confidence interval and the hypothesis testing should arrive at the same conclusion. It says, if there is a difference, then zero will not be in the confidence interval. If zero is in the confidence interval, then that means there, are there is a chance that they're the same. So you don't, you can't definitively say, okay? So it says in Ireland, the government grew suspicious that there may be age discrimination for promotions. Among 23 workers unsuccessful in gaining a promotion, the average age was 47 with a standard deviation of 7.2. Among 30 workers successful in gaining a promotion, the average age was 43.9 with a standard deviation of 5.9. Assume age follows a normal distribution. So what they did is they took two samples. They're both independent of each other. They're not the same sample group. You have the people um, that did not get promotion and the people that did get promoted, okay? Um, these are two different groups, okay? Um, now, and they're taken from the, the same population, but they're two different samples, and we're talking about the people that did versus the people that did not get promoted. So among 30 workers successful in gaining promotion, the average age was 43.9 with a standard deviation of 5.9. Assume age follows a normal distribution, so they gave us this, which is good, All right? Um, it says construct a 90% confidence interval for the difference between the mean age of unsuccessful applicants and the mean age of successful applicants. So what we're going to do is we're going to get out our calculator and we're going to go into two sample T interval. Okay, so we can see our interval and then we can interpret it. So we're going to go into stat test then we're going to go into two sample T int. Um, on mine, two sample T int is number 10 on mine. <clears throat> and we're going to use statistics. So X1, so let's say um, unsuccessful. Uh, yeah, let's say unsuccessful. Um, that will be my X bar one. What was X bar one? 47. What was S1? 7.2. And what was N1? 23. Okay. So let's do successful um, at gaining promotion. Average age was 40, uh, X bar two was 43.9. S two was 5.9 and N two was 30. Okay. So now we're going to go into two sample E interval, let's see what we get. So let me plug this in, 47, um, 7.2, um, 23x bar 2 would be 43.9, 5.9, and 30. Confidence level, we're 90%. Um, let's try. Okay, so I did unpooled and I got negative 0 0.0078 comma 
0.2078. Okay, so I have 6.2078. Okay, so now here's the big deal. Okay, so we have our confidence interval. Now remember, if we were doing a hypothesis test, if hypothesis testing, um, the null would have been mu1 equals mu2, right? Which means that mu1 minus mu2 would equal zero, okay? That's what the null would imply, right? Is that mu1 minus mu2 equals zero. So is it possible that zero is in here somewhere? Well, yes, because you go from negative 0 0.0078 to positive 6.2, the null could definitely have been in there, okay? So that's what the confidence interval is trying to talk to us about. It says that if there is a difference between the two means, zero will not be in the confidence interval. However, zero is in the confidence interval. So we say, since zero is in the confidence interval, there does not appear to be a difference in the hiring age, or uh, sorry, not hiring, promotion. Okay, so um, again, they wanted us to see if it did appear that there was some kind of bias or discrimination happening because of the age of a worker. Um, but according to this data, we're going to say no, there doesn't appear to be that. Um, so uh, again, that's the, if we were doing a hypothesis test, we would say we cannot support that claim. Um, we're doing a confidence interval, so we're also not supporting that claim. We're saying that there doesn't appear to be a difference, even though the alternate would say there is. Right, so we can't support that. So this is how you can use a confidence interval um, to do this problem. Okay, so let's try another one. So you guys should pause the video and, and try this. Okay. All right, so you guys are unpaused. So let, let's, um, let me go through it now. So it says a randomized trial tested the effectiveness of diets for adults among 40 subjects using Weight Watchers. The mean weight loss for one year was 33.0 pounds with a standard deviation of 0.9 pounds. Among 35 subjects on the Atkins diet, the mean weight loss for one year was 2.1 pounds with a standard deviation of 0.8 pounds. Construct a 95% confidence interval for the difference in the population mean weight losses. Is there a difference in effectiveness of the two diets? So they wanna see if one diet is better than the other. Is Weight Watchers better than Atkins in terms of um, losing weight? So they're gonna to try to compare the average weight loss, okay? Um, if we were doing a hypothesis test, if we were, doing a hypothesis test, the null would be, the null would be mu1 equals mu2, which implies mu1 um, minus mu2 equals zero. And the alternate hypothesis, if we just care about difference, would mean mu1 does not equal mu2, and that would imply that mu1 minus mu2 does not equal zero. So that's the implication of saying that mu1 equals mu2 and mu1 does not equal mu2, is that when you subtract them, you'll get zero. If you have two things that are the same and you subtract them, you'll get zero. If you have two things that are different and they're not the same, I'm sorry, if you have two things that are different when you subtract them, you will not get zero. That's it's pretty cut and dry. That's what they're saying. However, we're doing a confidence interval, but the idea is similar. Okay, the, the thinking behind it is the same. So let's write down everything we know. We need um, Weight Watchers, and then we need Atkins. Right, so the mean weight loss for one year was three, so X bar one was 3.0, S1 and N1. This will be X bar two, oops. And I encourage you guys to write this out. Um, this will really help you kind of keep track of everything. Um, I think it's smart on your part to try to um, uh, pretend like you were in class with me and we were doing this together and you want to write down all the information you have. It, it really helps you um, feel like you're, you're listening to a lecture or discussing things with me instead of just watching a one hour video or a 30 minute video with no input whatsoever. 
Um, so it says among 40 using Weight Watchers, um, the mean weight loss the standard deviation of 0.9. Okay. Um, then we have X bar two for Atkins, which was 2.1 pounds with standard deviation of 0 0.08. No, not 0 0.08, sorry, 0 0.8. And there was um, 35 subjects. Okay, so hopefully that's, um, I didn't misread something. Everything's good right there. So now let's do our confidence interval. So we're gonna go clear, we're gonna go stat, test, and then we're gonna go down to, I believe it was 10 I said, two sample T interval. So we're gonna do two sample interval. Let's see what we get. So I'm going to go into three. Then I'm going to go 0.9 for my standard deviation. Then I'm going to go 40. Then I'm going to go 2.1.8 for my standard deviation and 35. My confidence level was 95. And we're going to go unpooled. And we should get point. 508, uh, let's go 0 0.508, eight. Uh, and the other one, let's go 1.2912, I believe on my calculator I got. So now what number is not in there? So if you're on a number line and you go from 0 0.5088 to 1.29, you never have to deal with zero. Zero is not in the confidence interval. So if we look back up here, because zero is not in the confidence interval, there is a difference between the two means. So we come over here and we say, since zero is not in the confidence interval, there does appear to be a difference Basically, they're saying that the two diets do seem to have um, different average weight losses. Um, so that is something to look at. And then we would go on to say, well, is one better than the other? That's a different situation. All we found was that there does appear to be a difference. And then you need to go and research that. Okay. So um, the next one is inferences about two means match pairs. I think I'm going to stop the video here. Um, this will be our last section from chapter nine. Um, and then we will have a couple weeks left to finish chapter 10 and take our exam. And then we will have our final. So uh, we're almost done with the course, guys. I have probably another three videos, maybe four total to send out the rest of the semester. And then we'll be ready. Okay, you guys, see you in the next meeting. Um, I'm going to end the video.